Welcome, welcome, Caroline Haycock. Professor Caroline Haycock is a professor of linguistics at the University of Edinburgh and a fellow with the British Academy. Um, she's extremely well known in syntax, has done a lot of very important work uh, on the syntax of English, Germanic, also Japanese. Uh, very broad in terms of not only the languages and topics, but also the types of consideration that she's brought to bear to the field of syntax, including recently and, and less recently acquisition, uh, attrition, uh, and a prominent amount of work in language change and historical syntax, work that's been very influential. Her PhD uh, was from the University of Pennsylvania, titled Layers of Predication, um, and took um, uh, interest in and new views on. Uh, the nature of the relationship between subjects and predicates. To those outside the field, it may sound a little bit interesting. She proposed that the, uh, that the subject predicate relation is a, a fundamental relationship of syntax, which at the time was a, a challenging proposal, uh, despite what we learn in grammar school. Um, uh, evidence from, uh, that she brought to bear in the dissertation included evidence from popular clauses, which I see as something that we'll be returning to today. Um, it was funny, just as we started up the, at the very beginning of this, uh, we were told that uh, there were some, she was having some connectivity problems. Uh, I can't believe that's true at all. She wrote one of the most important groundbreaking papers on connectivity in 1995, also known as Reconstruction, uh, an LI paper, widely cited and very important in the field. I know her work best in Germanic syntax. It's where our work overlapped the earliest and the most. Um, and this included topics like uh, embedded root phenomena and verb movement. Uh, a prominent uh, area of work in this uh, of hers involves Faroese, a um, little set of islands with an oversized contribution to the field, um, but also um, uh, on Scandinavian generally. Uh, I was fortunate enough to serve as co-editor for a paper she uh, co-authored and submitted to the Journal of Comparative Germanic Linguistics, uh, had served as a guest editor for a special volume of. Um, this was on that topic on loss of uh, V to T in Scandinavian, fabulous paper. I happened to find on my uh, notebook here, uh, quote, or the original reviews. So let me quote from reviewer two, because we always wanna know about reviewer two. Reviewer two said, this is an important article. It will be of great value. And the results are, are uh, the results and conclusions are interesting and exciting. This characterizes all of her work, I would say. Um, but if you're getting this kind of quote from reviewer two, then you're doing something very, very well. Uh, more recently, some of the uh, work that she's known for includes collaborative work on the Scots, uh, at Scots Syntax Atlas project. And that includes a 2019 paper in language. Uh, which received a Eureka Alert from the American Academy of uh, no, American Association for the Advancement of Science, which tries to publicize work um, uh, that should be of broad interest, which of course this is. I could go on and on, but I won't. Uh, I'll just mention very quickly beyond research that she's contributed a lot to service and teaching, including a stint as co-editor in chief of the Journal of Linguistics, the Journal of the Linguistic Society of Great Britain and a fabulous series of, of syntax lectures on YouTube that we have to mention. Um, this was uh, put up pre-pandemic, but was a lifeline to those of us who suddenly were scrambling to find high quality material uh, online to make available to students and to enjoy ourselves. This was extremely useful for us. So I'm sure we're all waiting to hear more uh, about what she has to say about being. So we will uh, turn it over to her and just say again how wonderful it is uh, to welcome Professor Caroline here. So I hope you can uh, hear me okay. Um, and I, I have to say, as I, I have been having some problems with connection, I, um, I, I originally arrived on time and then I was thrown off completely. So I really hope this doesn't happen as we go along. If, if it does, my apologies. Um, so I, first of all, I'd just like to thank you very much for, in, for this fantastic invitation. It's obviously a, a huge honor to be invited uh, to give a lecture in this series, also completely terrifying. Um, and uh, I'm also very grateful for that lovely introduction. And to be reminded of uh, uh, the only possibly reviewer to um, notice I've ever got that was quite that positive. Although I did actually get a great one from language once, which, um, where the most negative thing was it said that my, my English should be checked by a native speaker. So, um, 
you may also struggle with my accent and I hope that isn't too much of a problem. So let me um, first, uh, let me try sharing my screen with you. Um, I did send a, a handout, which I hope you've all ha have access to. Um, it, the content is exactly the same as the slides, uh, with almost no exceptions. Uh, but I, I know from myself that uh, it can be very frustrating with slides that uh, you want to go back and see something and the person is showing you the wrong slide um, or, or you want to jump forwards. So I, I, I hope you all have access to that um, uh, if you wish it, but the content is exactly the same. So let me try sharing my screen. Oh, great. I see that Victoria has put up a, a link to the handout. I, I have got the, the chat up, but I must admit that uh, my ability to multitask is, is kind of stretched. Um, so uh, I may not pay attention enough uh, if people have got questions in the chat as we go along. So if I don't notice them, I hope it's, uh, we can just take that up at the end. Okay, so um, I'm very happy to, to be here. I um, or I'm almost there. The, what I uh, want to talk about today is, as John was suggested, uh, a topic that uh, has come back to my conscious consciousness uh, over a very long time. Uh, and that is uh, particularly what I'm going to talk about today is the topic of predication involving nominals. And this is something that I've come back to at different points in my career. And some of the work I'm going to talk about today goes back a considerable amount of time. Some is work that I'm doing currently. Um, and a lot of this work has been done in collaboration. And the main collaborators that I'm, whose work I'm drawing on particularly now are given on this handout. So Lisa Cheng, Jutta Hartman, and Roberto Zamparelli. And the, the reason that I think I keep back, coming back to this topic is I think it poses very interesting questions for syntacticians like me. And it also um, forces us to uh, look at areas where we're really, where syntax is butting up against semantics on the one hand. And, and this is particularly true of the more recent work that I'm doing uh, with uh, Jutta Hartmann with issues in morphology. So it's, uh, for me, it's a very um, a fascinating area. And I hope to be able to convey to you today some of the issues that arise from what looks like uh, a particularly uh, small word um, in almost any language where there is such a word, the, the verb to be. And in fact, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, you'll see, doesn't even involve the, word, the verb to be. Um, because, as we'll see, the, um, the issue of nominal predication is only uh, indirectly connected to the copula itself. So, to begin with this first slide then, I said I'm going to be talking about nominal predication. So, we typically think of predication as involving so a subject and a predicate, and the typical predicate involves a verb. But we know there are cases where we have non-verbal predication and typical kinds of examples are the ones that I've given in one there. So in 1a, the predicate is absolutely amazing, an adjective phrase. Uh, in 1b, it's a prepositional phrase in a bad mood. In 1c, now a noun phrase. But you might obviously object, yeah, but there is a verb there. There's b, and although it's a very unusual verb, it does have certain verb properties. It carries tense, it agrees. So um, you might object that these aren't cases where we have nonverbal predication. Of course, in many languages, the what's expressed in uh, one would in fact be expressed without a verb. And even in English, there are contexts where we don't need the copula be to establish predication. And two such contexts are given in two and three. So it, after certain verbs like consider, Although you can say they consider that Alex is absolutely amazing, so you can have a full clause with the verb to be. It's also fine to express the proposition that Alex is absolutely amazing just with 
the predicate and the subject without any copula. And this gets called a small clause. So you can say they consider Alex absolutely amazing, they consider Boo in a bad mood, and so on. So that's one context where you get predication, including nominal predication, as in the case of 2C, without any copula at all. And another um, instance where we find the same thing is what's called the absolutive with construction, where you, um, and, and this is illustrated in three. So just as you can say they consider Alex absolutely amazing, you could also say, with Alex absolutely amazing, we're going to look good. And it means something like, given that Alex is absolutely amazing, we're going to look good. So that case is with an adjective phrase, and then with 3C, you see it again with a noun phrase. So it looks like predicates don't have to be verbal. You, they can be adjective phrases, preposition phrases, or noun phrases. And it's the last case that I'm most interested in, and we're going to talk about today. Um, one consequence of this is, well, what is the verb be doing if you can establish predication without be? Um, and the, the typical assumption about the English copula be is that, in fact, it carries very little meaning itself. And it's generally treated as a raising predicate, like seem. Um, although it clearly is, I've called it a verb here, it's clearly got a, a slightly different category, but this is a simplification that will do for us. But the crucial point is, it takes this small clause as its complement, so the predication is established in this small clause that we already saw, so with Alex absolutely amazing, we're in great shape. You take that small clause, it's the sister of B, and then its subject can become the subject of the whole clause, which here I'm assuming is a projection of tense. So B is just a, a kind of raising predicate. Um, it also does the job in English of carrying tense information, which in English is only possible for um, verbal elements. Since at least the early 90s, most syntacticians have assumed that small clauses have a certain amount of internal structure including a functional head and the typical assumption uh, following the work of Bowers in particular is that there's a dedicated functional head uh, um, which is, gets called per or um, a pred for predication um, and this mediates between the subject and the predicate so you see a small clause here is taken to be a, a PRP the head which is in this case phonologically silent, it takes as its complement the predicate and its specifier as the subject. Importantly, it does this even though the complement is already a predicate. So there's no reason to think that absolutely amazing is being turned into a predicate by this PR head. It seems that already all the evidence is that it's already a predicate. Um, and that's also something um, to bear in mind, uh, because this will become uh, relevant in a moment. So the case that I'm most interested in, so we've seen already um, nominals that can act as predicates. And the most challenging case, and the, the one that I'm most interested in here, is where we have definite noun phrases. So typically, definite noun phrases, like proper names, denote individuals. And when they show up in predicate position, this is often assumed to motivate the existence of a distinct B. So a B that isn't a raising verb, but is effectively a transitive verb. That is that it takes two arguments that are both referring. So in 6A, for example, you've got a name on the left and you've got a definite expression on the right. And 6B, I've attached non-restrictive relatives to both of those phrases. So the child you met yesterday, who you liked so much, is in fact Dawn, who I had been telling you about. And since um, a work that Susan Rothstein did a long time ago, um, the assumption is these non-restrictive relatives can really only attach to referring expressions. So it looks like you've got two entity denoting expressions, neither of them is a predicate. But in fact, it's been known for a long time, although it, it often gets forgotten, um, at least some definites really do have the distribution of predicates. And one hallmark of this 
is precisely that they occur in these small clauses. They don't need B. So although the cases in eight are un unacceptable pretty much, where a name has been used in the predicate position of a small clause, the examples in seven seem fine. So you can say they consider Dawn the child who'll do best, or with Dawn the child who do best, our class is going to look good. So you've got a definite, the child who do best, but it's functioning as a predicate. So it really looks like some predicates really, some definites really can act as predicates. And the ability to occur in these kind of small clauses is an important diagnostic for this. But there are other diagnostics um, that people have used, including certain kinds of coordinations that you can do. So there's plenty of different kinds of evidence for this. Now, so I'm, uh, I'm a syntactician. So one of the things then that questions that interests me is whether definites that can occur as predicates, do they have a distinct syntax from definites that occur in argument positions, that definites that refer to individuals? So, well, what is the structure of definite noun phrases in English in any case? So the most obvious encoding of definiteness in English is done by including the definite article the or the. Um, I should just mention that these definites hide an ambiguity that's overt in, other, in a number of other languages. And that's the ambiguity between what have been called strong and weak definites. We could also think of as anaphoric or unique definites. So anaphoric definites refer to still, still unique or maximal objects, but they refer to objects that have been introduced in the discourse context, possibly via various kinds of bridging. So in 9a, you say, I bought a book yesterday. You've mentioned a book, and now you can say when the author wrote the book. So the book there can be taken to be an, an anaphoric definite. It's anaphoric back to the previous mention of a book. And slightly more indirectly, we could also take the author to be anaphoric because it, by a bridging relation, because books have authors. So that what gets called an anaphoric definite or a strong definite. On the other hand, there are also uh, definites which are appear to be definite by virtue of the fact that they have a single or maximal element in the property denoted by their restrictor. So they're inherently unique. Um, so some cases are like the moon and other cases are, for example, things like superlatives, like the closest star. So by virtue of what superlatives mean, that makes this a definite. So in both cases, there is some notion of uniqueness or um, what gets called more generally maximality. And this is taken to be a crucial part of what being a definite is. So just to go through this a little bit, the reason we talk about maximality and not just uniqueness is because that extends also to plurals. So just to give you an intuitive sense, because these are going to be important um, characteristics. Uh, say I bought a cat yesterday, you can then say the cat is gorgeous. You've introduced one cat and you can refer to it as the cat. If you say I bought two cats yesterday, you've mentioned two cats, but you can't then say the cat is gorgeous because the cat you have mentioned you have mentioned two cats so you could you think you could do anaph some kind of anaphoric reference but the cat presupposes the existence of a unique cat that's been mentioned and since there are two that that presupposition fails similarly in the plural and this is why you want to want what might want to talk of maximality uh, if you say i bought three cats yesterday you can say the cats are gorgeous that's going to pick up anaphorically all three of them you can say the three cats are gorgeous. What you can't say is the two cats are gorgeous because the two cats would presuppose there are only two, right? So it's not maximal. So, so then if we're looking at, so that's what we get with, with the in English. Many languages don't have a distinct definite article, but they nevertheless express definiteness. And uh, they do it in different ways. In some languages, definiteness seems to be encoded by word order within the nominal phrase itself. So one such language is Bangla, 
an Indo-Aryan classifier language um, that's been described um, by various people, including the, the citations on the slide. And so the example that I've given in 13 is from a paper by uh, Venita Dayal. So, uh, and what you see here is, so a noun phrase in Bangla, you can have, you can have a numeral, then a classifier. So by saying it's a classifier language, and um, we'll see other cases like this, um, these are languages where when you're counting uh, objects, you need to include this function word, the classifier, um, as well as the numeral. And the classifier may vary according to the particular class of things that's being counted. And we'll also see, in fact, in some cases, in some languages, classifiers occur even without a numeral. But here we see an example of a language where you get the numeral, a classifier, and then a noun. And in 13a, um, you see them occur in that order. Uh, and I see, I thought I'd been so careful about these slides. So I've, there's a mistranslation. So um, the uh, tin is three. So the original sentence should say three students came. The translation is wrong. Um, and 13a, you could follow this up with two. So do is two. Two classifier students came. Um, two classifier students sat. Um, I'm sorry that I failed to catch that. So the correct gloss there is two classifier students sat. And it means two students sat down. And that's perfectly acceptable. And it can mean two of the students that have been talked about. Another possible order in Bangla is where the noun, rather than following the classifier, comes at the beginning of the noun phrase, preceding the number. So the order in 13b is a grammatical order in this language, but that sentence is infelicitous in this context. And the reason for that seems to be that it means the two students sat down. That is now, the two students is maximal. There's a presupposition that's the maximal set of students that's been mentioned. And since that presupposition is not met in this context, the sentence is infelicitous. So it appears in this language that um, definiteness in the sense of maximality is encoded by the position of the noun. So when the noun is occurring further to the left, you're getting this definiteness interpretation. In other languages, um, there may be no apparent syntactic encoding of uh, definiteness at all. So one such language where, at least superficially, um, this might be seen to be the case uh, is Cantonese. So particularly in, so in this one uh, type of noun phrase where you have a classifier followed by a noun. So notice here it's possible to have a classifier and the noun and no numeral. And in this case, uh, as you see in 14, you can get a definite interpretation. So the sentence in 14, where you just have the object is the classifier noun, that can either mean I bought a book or I bought the book. So a definite interpretation is possible. And in subject position, classifier noun has only a definite interpretation. So this sentence in 15 means the dog was outside and it cannot mean a dog was outside. So we are seeing here there is an effect of the position of the noun phrase, but the, the noun phrase itself, there's no obvious um, marker of definiteness, whether in terms of there's no specific item um, and there's no change in the order associated with the definite versus indefinite interpretation. But actually, even in English, although the typical definites we think of um, have the definite termina, there are definites that don't involve this. And uh, two cases uh, that we can look at, at least briefly, um, are what are called Saxon genitives, and the other case is coordinated bare noun phrases. So Saxon genitives, so these are cases where we have a possessor, a possessed noun phrase, and the possessor is expressed pre-nominally, either in this case um, with a noun phrase with an, the S clitic, or also, in fact, with a possessive pronoun. 
So as is uh, well known about these cases, these possessed noun phrases get a, a, an interpretation of uniqueness or maximality. So um, you can see this um, in 16a. So if you say Dalal sisters in Kigali and Dalal sisters in Kampala, this seems like a contradiction. Why is it a contra contradiction? Because Dalal sister has the same presupposition that we get with the, with the definite determiner, that is that she only had, there is a unique sister. And in the same way, if you say, I bought three shirts yesterday, my two shirts were very expensive. That is infelicitous in exactly the same way as if you'd said, uh, the two shirts that I bought were very expensive. So um, here we're getting a definite interpretation, but without the definite determinant. Um, a case that's a little bit less well known is something that I worked on with Roberto Zamparelli um, way back. Um, and this is something which occurs in English, but also uh, in a number of Romance languages, where you can get a definite interpretation by coordinating two, uh, two noun phrases without any determiner. So, um, for example, in 17, so John bought a, a dog and a cat on Monday. Later that week, he took cat and dog to the vet and had them vaccinated. And that's perfectly grammatical. There's two things that are odd about that, right? So one is that normally we can't have nouns without determiners in the singular count nouns without determiners. So you can't say he took cat to the vet. So one thing is it's strange that you don't need a determiner. And the other thing that's remarkable about it is it gets a definite interpretation. And some uh, evidence for that is in 17b, say John bought two cats and two dogs on Monday, later that week he took cat and dog to the vet. Again, it's odd in just the same way as if you said later he took the cat and the dog to the vet. It fails because of the maximality presupposition. And in 18, uh, you see, here's another example. There was one for place setting, fork and spoon were both on the left. Um, it seems to refer anaphorically to place setting, since place settings contain typically forks and spoons. And another indication that it's definite is that in existential construction uh, introduced with there, which in English really don't like definites, um, this is infelicitous. So there were fork and spoon on the table is really quite bad. Um, and we would argue that's because that's the same fact as you can't say there was the fork. So, so here's another case where we're getting a definite interpretation without an actual definite um, article. And, and it's um, one thing uh, that's also striking about this is these coordinated bare definites are strong definites in the sense that we talked about before. That is, they're necessarily anaphoric. Um, these new mentioned definites, where you have uniqueness that's just guaranteed by their meaning or guaranteed by a restriction, these seem to be quite bad. So it's perfectly fine to say, I couldn't enjoy the film. The man and the woman in front of me or the man and woman in front of me were blocking my view. So you can have a definite in that context, licensed by the restriction by in front of so in front of me but you can't say i couldn't enjoy the film man and woman in front of me were blocking my view and the second example makes the same point so here's a case where the contrast between strong and weak definiteness which we don't really see with the definite determiner in english we we do see in this corner of the syntax uh, of english um, and I'll speak very briefly about the analysis that we that we gave for these cases. Going back though to these um, possessive possessive cases, we we already saw that um, these Saxon genitives possess nominals in English in, in argument position. They have this uniqueness maximality interpretation that definites have. So if you say my book is on the table and my book is on the floor, it's very odd because the presupposition of my book is that there's only there's a unique book and it can only be one place at once. In 20b, I think the same thing is true in the plural. So Joe's tools are here and Joe's tools are also there. I don't think it's as bad, but I think this the same thing would be true. In fact, if you had the definite determiner, um, 
so I think the, the case is maybe a little, a little bit less clear here, but, but in general, um, I think it's fairly well established that um, in argument possession, these possessors behave, they behave like definites. However, uh, what's also well known is that in predicate position, this maximal or this um, unique interpretation is lost. So while it's odd to say my book is on the table and my book is on the floor, it's absolutely fine to say the one on the left is my book and the one on the right is also my book. So here, my book um, doesn't seem to presuppose there's only a single book. And similarly, you can say these are Joe's tools and those are also Joe's tools and there's no oddness at all. So in predicate position, uh, there is no definite interpretation. So that's a striking fact. However, if you add a numeral which goes after the possessive, the uniqueness or maximality interpretation seems to return. And this was pointed out by Roberto Zamparelli way back, um, way back when he was writing his dissertation. So you can say, um, while um, these are Joe's tools, so those are also Joe's tools is absolutely fine. But if you say these are Joe's four tools and those are also Joe's four tools, that is much worse because, and it seems that here, Joe's four tools does presuppose that is the maximal set of tools in the context. So, so what's going on? Well, back at the time uh, uh, he wrote the dissertation, the account that uh, Zamparelli gave was to say, within a, a nominal projection, which we're going to call a DP, the projection of a determiner, there are multiple functional heads, which you call different levels. And the outermost is what he called the strong DP. And this is argumental. It denotes an entity or, or a generalized quantifier. And then below it is a projection which hosts, among other things, numerals. And then below that, there's a noun phrase. Now, there may be other, other functional heads and people and, and uh, many people have uh, posted many other ones and we'll see a more articulated structure shortly, but at least this. And what he proposes is that some heads can only appear in one position and others are ambiguous as to the position um, that they appear. And, uh, and then what he suggests is that in the example in 21, which was these are Joe's tools, he says, well, here, the possessor is realized as the specifier of the num p. So, um, see, no, you can't see it. Okay. Ah, um, let me, I'm sorry, I hoped that I could. Very slowly, right. Um, I'm sorry, I'm Yes, okay, now it works. So the idea is that the possessor occurs here, in this case. So, and if we assume that that clitic S occupies the, the head position, which is a frequent assumption, it would occupy the num head position. And the specifier position is occupied by the, the possessor. So Joe would be appearing then at the edge of the num P. Definiteness is not triggered at that, uh, is not associated with that um, level of the, of the nominal phrase. On the other hand, if there is a numeral, the idea was, then that num position is preempted by the numeral. So the possessor cannot appear here. Instead, the possessor has to appear here. So that's saying that possessors are ambiguous in the position. Well, they have two different positions. They can occur within the noun phrase. The lower position is associated, has no definite, no maximality uh, interpretation. The higher position does. So that was the account that um, he gave in 2000. So as it's stated, this system entails that if you've got a possessive that includes a numeral, like Joe's four tools. It's not only maximal, it isn't a predicate, because 
by being that maximal noun phrase, the strong DP, it's a referring expression. So what, um, what uh, Zamparelli had to say then was to say that the copula clauses, like these are Joe's four tools, he said, well, you're, the reason you can say that is that we know that we have equitive copula clauses. We know that it's possible to have this transitive B, which takes two entity denoting expressions and somehow equates them. But in fact, that can't be what's going on, or at least it's not the only possible thing that's going on. Because actually, we can have both the maximal interpretation, both the maximality and predicative status simultaneously. So in 24, for example, you can say something like narcissism and oversensitivity. I consider these Joe's two main weaknesses. So now we've got consider followed by a small clause. Its subject is these. And then the predicate is Joe's two main weaknesses. Now that presupposes that Joe only has two main weaknesses. It presupposes maximality. That's a definite interpretation. But it's also occurring in predicate position within this consider clause. And the same thing in 24 with this uh, absolute of with construction, you can say, so with bankruptcy or flight, Joe's two remaining options, they were near despair. So what we see is we actually need a three-way distinction in interpretation for these possessed noun phrases. They can be predicative and non-maximal. That's when you say, so these are Joe's tools and those are also Joe's tools. They can be predicative and maximal, and that's what we're getting when we add a numeral, but still can have them in predicate position. Or when they're arguments, they always seem to be interpreted as maximal. And it also seems the distinction has something to do with the possession, uh, position of the possessive within the nominal. So in more recent work then that uh, is done as a collaboration with Lisa Chang and Roberto Zamparelli, what we suggested is that we need to expand a bit on that uh, on that structure for uh, for a noun phrase, and um, and in particular, we need to split the um, the idea of a this this one DP position into two. So what you've got here is just a slightly expanded version. At the bottom, we've got the noun phrase. Then there's this classifier phrase. This is not going to be um, this is going to turn out to be relevant in a moment. For for the moment, it's not relevant when I talk about English, although this is also associated with where plurality is um, generated in English. But I'm going to set that aside. Above that, we have the numP just as before. And then the assumption is there is a weak DP and a strong DP. And the idea is that so strong, the anaphoric definites correspond to a different projection than the weak definites. So the strong one is the higher one. It's going to have a pronominal index. That's what makes it anaphoric. And this is not our suggestion. This has been made by many other people. Um, and then below that, there is a different, uh, the weak DP projection. And the suggestion is that that can, in fact, either translate as a predicate or it can also be an argument. Um, syntactically, when I, uh, in either case, and this is uh, again coming from Zamparelli's earlier work, the idea would be that when either case, either head is null, it can be licensed by having a specifier. And semantically, the strong DP is going to be entity denoting, or it can denote a, quanti a, a generalized quantifier. And that's similar to what was said before. The weak DP, on the other hand, the idea is that this is essentially predicative. So, so basically it passes up the interpretation that it gets from the num P, which is also predicative. But what it introduces is the presupposition that the property is unique or maximal. And that's essentially, um, what Kopok and Beaver in a, uh, I think, a very beautiful paper in 2015 
proposed, they called this the weak Fragian treatment of Z. So, but here we're associating it with a particular position with this weak DP position within the, um, within the nominal projection. So, so this weak DP is predicative in type. However, we also assume that there's a type shifting, type shifting operator which can take singleton or maximal properties and return their unique or maximal element. So if you've got a property which is only true of a unique um, entity or of the, of the maximal uh, set of entities, um, this will give you that, um, that entity or that plural entity. Um, so that type shifter, it can apply to the output of the weak DP given that the presuppositions that that introduces, but it can't apply any lower. So the idea then is that these strong DPs are born as arguments. They're, they're, they're type E from the beginning. Weak DPs come in as predicates, but they can become arguments given this type shifting operator. And then any lower projection, so num P and lower, cannot acquire an argument interpretation in that, in that way. So those are uh, predicates or the assumption actually is that uh, further down you've got kinds, but that's not relevant for us here. And finally, we also assume a, a minimized structure principle. And this kind of assumption has been made by many people in different ways. The way we, um, the way we implement it here is to say that languages, you have to use the smallest category, which can accommodate all the material in the numeration. So basically, all the, all the um, words, all the words and elements that you take out of the lexicon, you've got to be able to include those within your syntactic structure. In addition, um, you have to use the smallest category which has or can be converted to the appropriate semantic type. So that is to say, if you've got an argument, you need the type to be type E or the type for a generalized quantifier. And for property, it's need to be, uh, it needs to be appropriate types of function from entities to truth values. So that's the basic structure that's proposed for the, uh, for the noun phrase. So it's just a, a slight expansion on what was suggested before. Um, and here the idea, the crucial difference, or one of the crucial differences, is that maximality is introduced at this level. And this is not, but this is not the level um, at which you uh, this is still a level at which you can have a predicative interpretation. So, and this is just um, then summing up some of the things that can occur in these positions, glossing over the distinction between what occurs as the head and what occurs as a specifier. So the idea here then is that um, this and that, for example, the demonstratives, those occur uniquely in the highest position. V, on the other hand, can occur either in this position or it can occur lower. This is what gets you the ambiguity between the strong and the weak interpretation of definites. It, and it's also what allows us to have V uh, introducing predicates. Um, so definite predicates would be this much of the nominal. We, um, a slight variant of the, an early analysis we gave of these coordinated bare definites is in fact that um, what we assume is that the coordinate head moves at LF to this high position and it licenses a silent determiner. Because it's the highest position, this gives us the um, anaphoric strong nature of these conjoined bare definites but I'm not going to talk about them very much um, for lack of time. They were here in an earlier version of this talk. Um, so, um, so basically we've got V occurring in different positions. We've got the demonstratives occurring only in one position and uh, numerals occur lower down and possessors, as we've seen, can occur in different positions. And that's what gives us the different interpretations that you get for the possessors um in in predicate position uh the lowest the best place they could occur is in this lowest position they only occur 
in this higher position if you're forced to do this. So if the numeral, as I said, preempts the num position, the, the possessor is forced to be higher, and that then forces the definite, uh, at the same time, forces the definite interpretation. So, so just to sum that up, the idea then is definites can appear anywhere as arguments, provided they're licensed by one of the means that I've just been talking about. If possible, they should be weak DPs. If um, there's a reason to make them strong DPs, then that's, uh, that is possible, as long as there's something um, available to, to um, license that much structure. The perfect candidate for the, for the weak definites, in fact, is superlatives. Um, and just in passing, it's possibly symptomatic that these are actually quite bad if you want to give them an antecedent. Um, so in 26, you can say Mark from Serbia was taller than any other living person. Unsurprisingly, the tall Serbian was a basketball player, it's fine. But unsurprisingly, the tallest Serbian was a basketball player, referring anaphorically back to the same person. It, it's, it's quite odd, and that may be a reflex of this fact. But the case I'm mostly focusing on is the predicative case. So the idea here is that the minimal structure to get a predicate interpretation is numpy or even smaller. It can accommodate possessors, but there's no maximality presupposition. The weak DP, which introduces the maximality presupposition, it's projected only if there is the in the numeration where you've got to have, that's the lowest position in which you can insert the, or you can get it, as I was saying, if the possessive marker is forced to be high by the presence of a numeral. Um, and that's the case of these are Joe's four tools. So, so there is um, uh, a case of, of um, just some discussion then of how we derive the particular interpretations we get for these possessive definites in English. And something else that we think derives from this is another striking fact about definite predicates. And that is, and this was uh, originally uh, pointed out to us by our colleague Lisa Cheng, uh, with whom, who is a collaborator in this work, is that in Cantonese, um, you don't seem to get definite predicates. So I illustrated some the classifier noun sequences in Cantonese earlier. So just to go back to that, if you have classifier noun sequences, they can get a definite interpretation in object position, and they can only get a definite interpretation in subject position. So 27 and 29, those are both cases where the classifier noun sequence is in subject position and is interpreted only as a definite. In object position, it can be interpreted either as a definite or as an indefinite. Um, so, sorry, I'm just trying to keep track. Um, that subject-object asymmetry, um, and, and as a number of people have pointed out, um, is reminiscent of something you find in romance, where uh, it is, it seems that you can find bare nouns in object position, but not in subject position. And the analysis that goes back now for a long way back to the 80s at least, is to say that in these languages, you've got a DP, so you have a determiner, you have a, a Z, but it's null, and it has to be licensed by being um, selected by the verb. So people talk about being licensed under C command. This effectively distinguishes objects from subjects, among other, among other things. So um, the idea then is that in 30, you see that having bare dogs as subject in Italian is ungrammatical, but it's fine in object position. So the idea is that in both cases, you have a, as a null determiner. That null determiner is licensed by the verb in object position, but not in subject position. So 
um, a number of people have uh, pointed out that this can make sense of facts also um, in a, a more than one of the Chinese languages. So with respect to Cantonese, we can extend this same analysis um, to explain the distribution of the indefinite interpretations for classify a noun sequence. So if we assume that those nominals that consist just of classify a noun are actually DPs with a silent D, that just as in Italian or other some of these other languages requires to be licensed by C command from the verb, you would expect that you would get that indefinite interpretation in object position, you would not get it in subject position. And that's exactly what we saw, that classifier noun cannot be interpreted as an indefinite in subject position, but it can in object position. But the obvi obvious issue is, but what about the definites? How is it that these classifier noun sequences are, are fine in subject position as long as you interpret them as definites? So the hypothesis is that the empty determiner can be a licensed by having material in the specifier of its head. So um, Zamparelli in his paper from 2013 argues that what happens in man um, in uh, sorry, this does not say Mandarin, but happens in Cantonese is a lower functional projection is moved to the specifier of the D head. And that movement uh, is then similar to what we saw in Bangla, in fact. It's not exactly the same, but it, uh, it's effect, uh, uh, at least analogous. And um, it's not exactly the same because the, the same size of thing is not moving. But the idea is you have a projection of the nominal moving to the specifier of D and crucially giving rise to a definite interpretation. And this is a suggestion which comes in other work as well. So um, Andrew Simpson has said things which are similar. So if we go back to this, uh, this more elaborated structure, what we now add in here is that in, the, um, in these possession, in these uh, specifier positions, in these higher, uh, of these higher projections, you can also have the classifier phrase, which, has, which moves to these positions. And when it does, it licenses the null D, so it makes it possible to occur both in subject and object position, but you get the definite interpretation, or and you get the definite interpretation. So what about predicates, though? So as I said before, the striking fact is that definite interpretations for classifier noun sequences in Cantonese don't seem to be possible. So, um, so for example, in the context we say, I'm telling a friend about my colleague's children, if you say Kim, copula, classify a boy, Jan, classify a girl, it's interpreted as Kim's a boy and Jan's a girl, it's absolutely fine. But now we set up a context where we've already introduced um, exactly one boy and exactly one girl. So we're talking about pupils who will be chosen to meet the prime minister and there'll be exactly two chosen, uh, one boy and one girl. If you produce the same sentence, so Kim, copula classifier boy, Jan, copula classifier girl, it's not really felicitous because it can only mean Kim is a boy and Jan is a girl. It cannot mean John is the boy and Jan is the girl. And this is quite striking given that we've seen that these definite interpretations otherwise occur both in object and in subject position. So why are they excluded from the predicate, um, from this predicative position? And the idea is this follows from this principle that I mentioned of minimized structure. So, and actually this is pretty much what's happening in English possessors as well. So the idea is that the minimal predicative structure is, is numpy or possibly lower. The point at which maximality comes in is this weak DP. And why would you introduce that much structure? Well, if you've got a head like V in the numeration, 
you're going to have to because this is the, the lowest point at which you can assert it. Or we saw the possessive in English, if you've got a numeral, it forces the possessor to be higher. So that will also mean that you've got this much structure. And in fact, you get similar effects in Cantonese when a possessor has to be high in a structure. But what we see here is in Cantonese, what was generating the, um, the definiteness was not, uh, uh, was not a definite determiner. What was happening was by, by hypothesis, this clitic phrase was moving into this position. Um, and it was therefore, yeah, so it was moving into that position. But here, there's no reason for it to do that. So already in terms of type, this is already a predicate. So the numP is already a predicate. There's nothing in, there's no item that's requiring this position. So, and, the, and this principle of minimized structure militates against generating it. So if you don't have any of those reasons to generate that structure, you can't generate it. So it follows then that in Cantonese, the predicate never gets to be bigger than this. So that then is an explanation for why definiteness is lacking in the interpretation of predicates, nominal predicates in, um, in Cantonese. So I now want to talk about the, the to move on to um, a case where it seems as though what we get in predicate position is not a, a predicative uh, nominal, but actually a, a referring expression. So a nominal that seems to refer to an individual. And as I, as I mentioned, such, such uh, cases have led to the conclusion there must be a distinct B that equates two individuals. And there is a whole lot of different cases, actually, where something like this seems to happen. I think they're very interesting. Um, I would love to talk about some of the other cases, but today I'm going to talk about a, uh, only one, which is something that, um, as some of you know, I've worked on a lot in various ways. And that is a particular case where what appears to occur after the copula is uh, a referring expression. And this is the type that gets called a specificational copula clause. So this is the type that syntacticians have mostly been concerned with in the last um, significant amount of time, particularly since um, ever since um, Higgins wrote a really brilliant dissertation way back in the 70s. So in the example in 38a, so here's a case where we've got the kind of uh, nominal predicate that I've been talking about so far, um, where you've got the best person for the job, the subject pat, that seems to refer to an individual, and the best person for the job, however, is predicative, and we can tell because you can get it in the small clause. So you can say, I consider pat the best person for the job. So copula clauses like this, where what occurs after the copula is predicative, get called predicational uh, copula clauses. But then you get examples like 39, where it seems it's the other way around. So the best person for the job is Pat. So now we've got the kind, what looks like the kind of definite that can be a predicate is in initial position. And in the post copula position, what you've got is something that refers to an individual. These that configuration has got some very peculiar properties. So one of the properties is that it has a fixed information structure. So normally in English, you can put the focus pretty much anywhere you like in a sentence. And that's true of predicational copula clauses. So when you've got a clause like the woman over there is the mayor, you can put focus either on the subject, the woman over there, or on the predicate, the mayor. And you can see this if we set up a context. So if you say, who's the mayor? That's going to put focus on the initial noun phrase. And you can say, that woman over there is the mayor. The specificational order would be, the mayor is that woman over there. And that's also fine as an answer in this context. So both of those are possible. But now if we try to put focus somewhere else, so if we say, who's that woman over there? Or tell me something about that woman over there. You can say, 
that woman over there is the mayor. So now we've got focus on the mayor and that's absolutely fine. But if the question is, tell me something about that woman over there. And you say, the mayor is that woman over there. That is very weird. Um, and what seems to be the case is in the specificational order, the new information focus has got to be the post copula part. So that's a quite strange restriction. Another strange thing that's known about these is that the first noun phrase, the pre copula noun phrase, even when it seems to be referring to a, a human individual, you can refer back to it with a neuter pronoun. So if you say the best person for the job just walked in, didn't, you have to say, didn't she, didn't he, didn't they, didn't it would be very strange. But the best person for the job is Elif, isn't it? It's absolutely fine, even for people who don't have an invariant tag. Um, and I'm one of one such person. So this use of it referring back to the best person is quite strange. And then the other thing that's notable about these is that in a number of languages, but not English, agreement behaves in a particular way. That is, agreement seems to be, agreement goes with the post copula noun phrase and not the pre copula one. So in English, you'd say the culprit is me. In Italian, you'd say the culprit am. You have to get, you'd have to get first person agreement, am I. So putting all of those things together, um, an analysis which goes back to work um, by Williams and Parti, but which is, was developed very strongly by uh, Andrea Moro in the 90s, uh, is to say that what's going on is these specificational sentences are inverted predications. So that is that really the first noun phrase is the predicate and the second noun phrase is the subject, even though that's a very surprising order for a language like English. How can that arise? Well, actually that raising structure that we saw for copula clauses makes this not that hard to derive because the idea would be that in the predicational case, you've got your copula, it takes a small clause, I've just gone back to calling it a small clause here, with um, a subject and a predicate. And then in the ordinary case, the subject of the small clause becomes the subject of the sentence. What's surprising about the specificational case is it's the predicate of the small clause that becomes the subject of the sentence. So, and that's, so that's how the inversion can happen. And some of the, the things that uh, back that up is the fact that one is that in a small clause complement to a verb like consider, it's very, you get the order um, uh, of subject predicate. So they consider that man. So there we've got a demonstrative. So this is a referring expression and their best friend. This is a case that can be a predicate. If we try to reverse it, it's much worse. Whereas their, be their best friend is that man is absolutely fine. So the idea is that if you're going to do the inversion, you need a place for the predicate to move to. Um, and within the small clause, there, there is no space for it. When we introduce B, we introduce an empty subject position that it can move to. So um, that would explain that the, the lack of this order in the small clause. Um, in, in her very nice work, um, going back 2005 and before it, Lena Mickelson argues that the pronominalization facts also follow, that is the use of the, the singular neuter pronoun to replace the, fir to replace the first DP. So, because what she points out is that you can't refer to predicates with gendered pronouns. So if you say, yesterday, Rena was the night nurse on duty, you can't then say, but tonight Hannah will be her. So, I, um, and so she, in the same way, the idea is that tonight the night nurse on duty will be Rena. You don't say, won't she? Uh, instead you say, won't it? So the idea is that the, what, what is ruling out the gendered pronoun is the same in both cases, that reference back to predicates is done with neuter pronouns. And 
Obviously, the agreement facts in languages like Italian are very suggestive because we very typically use agreement with the verb as a diagnostic for subject status. We're going to see, though, that it's not quite that straightforward. However, there are problems with this. So one problem is that those phenomenalization facts, actually. So it's uh, in English, it's actually quite hard to phenomenalize uh, a predicate. Um, so if you say, are you the nurse on duty? It's true that you wouldn't say, uh, yes, I am her or yes, I am him. But you also actually wouldn't say, yes, I am it. Right. So you would typically say, yes, I am. So we usually uh, do this other kind of ellipsis construction instead. Um, similarly, you, if you say John was her favorite nep nephew and, now, and then Bill was it, it's very, very odd. However, the best kind of case, I think, is the case that uh, Mickelson introduces that you can say he's a fool, even though he doesn't look it, or he's the best candidate, even though he doesn't look it. So there's a case where she argues now you're getting this uh, anaphoric reference back to a predicate with it. And if we look at related languages to English, we do see that's a very typical way to refer back to predicates, to use the, the least marked pronoun. However, um, it's also true that reference back to uh, predicates is only ever done with a single, well, in, uh, if we take the example look it to be diagnostic, it's always singular regardless of the apparent plurality of the, of the uh, property. So if you say they are fools, or they are the best candidates, even if they don't look it, that's okay. However, you can't say they are the best candidates, even if they don't look them, right? That I think is terrible. So it's really it in the singular. And that's, again, not surprising if you look at related languages. But now, now when we look at the specificational sentence, which by hypothesis is the predicate followed by the subject, it should behave in the same way. So you ought to say the best candidates are Atkinson and Pennack, isn't it? But that's not what you say. What you get instead is the best candidates are Atkinson and Pennack, aren't they? So actually the pronominalization is not really consistent with this being um, predicate and aphoral. Um, another problem is that it overgenerates in that there are predicates, even ones that are expressed with definites, which absolutely can't be inverted. So for example, you can say there are simple nurses, callous nurses, um, which kind of nurse is Joe? And you can say Joe's the first kind of nurse. Or I can say, and this, the first kind of nurse, it's a definite, it's this kind expression. It can be used in predicative, uh, a predicate construction again without B. So you can say, I consider Joe the first kind of nurse. But this can absolutely not occur as the subject of a specificational sentence. So if you say um, the sympathetic nurses give me an example of the second and callous nurses give me an example of the second kind of nurse, you can say Joe is a second kind of nurse, but you can't say the second kind of nurse is Joe. So and similarly, you can say Joe is something Jake is their kind or Joe is the one thing that I am not, right? She's intelligent. You cannot say something Jake is, is Joe, unless you mean that Jake is Joe, right? It has a completely different meaning. Um, in the same way, if I say, um, uh, uh, you are something I am not, and I try to invert it, I get, I get something I am not is you. That means something completely different. So, these cases ought to be fine as specificational sentences if you can just take the predicate and move it to subject position, but they're terrible. And then um, just coming back then to the possessives that we saw, one of the things that we saw about possessives is that in predicate position, they do not get a maximal definite interpretation without a numeral. So you can say, Joe is Jake's cousin, and Alex is also Jake's cousin. But if we have the specification order, we get Jake's cousin is Joe. Jake's cousin is also Alex. That's now very, very odd. Why is it odd? 
Well, it looks like it's odd because Jake's cousin presupposes the existence of only one cousin, but that's not what predicates do, right? We saw that possessors in predicate position don't have that presupposition. So it's not behaving like a predicate. An alternative explanation is that the subjects of specification sentences are not predicates. In, um, an alternative explanation is that they're what's called individual concepts. That is, their functions from worlds to individuals. So some noun phrases, some definites pick out individuals directly. So and, and names do this. So you could say whoever, you know, what um, Caroline refers to, it's the same today. It was the same person yesterday, it was the same person the day before yesterday. But you get certain definites whose reference depends on time or what possible world you're referring, you're interpreting them in. So uh, the Pope picks out a different person today than it picked out if we're talking about the world in 1850. So those kinds of definites are called individual concepts. And they've been used, uh, they've been proposed as one possible interpretation of what gets called a concealed question. So you can say they knew who was the winner or they knew who the winner was, or just they knew the winner, they announced the winner. So that use of the winner is a concealed question. Um, so one possibility then is that is uh, taken um, to be one way of thinking about concealed questions is that they're individual concepts. And then we could apply the same thing and say that that's what you're also getting in the winner was Julia. One nice thing about this is it gets the pronominalization, the pronominalization works the same way in both cases. So if you say Omer guessed the winner of the Oscar for Best Actress before I guessed it, that's fine, I think, with that, again, with that neuter it. But now if we pluralize, Omer guessed the winners before I guessed it is not very good, but Omer guessed the winners before I guessed them. So you get the neuter form in the singular, but you also get the plural case. So that looks similar to what we're seeing in these specificational sentences. And what we also get is the, the fact that the possessed, uh, a possessed noun phrase, um, you'd expect it to get a maximal or a definite reading because this is a kind of argument. It's not a predicate anymore. So that also um, falls out if we look at it this way. So if we assume this, and this was something that Romero, um, uh, Maribel Romero posed, what she said is, well, if we're going to do this, we need to have an interpretation of the copula that allows us then to combine the winner was Julia, an individual concept with an individual. And so what she said is we need an interpretation of the copula, which equates the value of the individual concept in the actual world and the individual um, that's named by the other noun phrase. And that's what what the interpreter that's what the um, interpretation in 56 does so that's so b is now interpreted as this specialized kind of equation which equates individual concepts the value of an individual concept in a particular world with an individual but notice that we now don't seem to have much reason to propose there's any inversion that's going on because a lot of the a lot of the motivation for talk about inversion was to say, well, we know we get subject and predicate in that order. In the specificational clause, the first noun phrase is the predicate, so it's moved, it's inverted, it's moved past a subject. But now we're saying no, the subject in these specificational sentences is not actually a predicate. So do we even need to say that there's any inversion? And certainly um, Romero was assuming that there was no inversion. Um, but that still, still leaves us with agreement um, because as I already mentioned, in some languages, agreement with the second noun phrase is either obligatory, and that's what you see in Italian and also seems to be what you find in German, or in a number of other languages, it's possible that is it's one of the options and and this kind of work that i've done with my colleague jutta hartmann uh so we looked across the german uh, some of the germanic languages um 
so specifically Dutch and German and Faroese and Icelandic. And what we found was that in Dutch and Faroese and Icelandic, agreement with the second DP was uh, an option. Uh, it varied both within speakers and between speakers, so a little bit different from what you find in Italian. But given that possibility, at least, does that mean we're, we're forced to say there's inversion? Because after all, we take, as I said, we take agreement with a noun phrase of a verb with a noun phrase, typically to be a diagnostic for that noun phrase being a subject. And in fact, however, although that is what we teach our students in the, at least what I typically teach my students uh, at the beginning when you're teaching them syntax and they want to know well, what's a subject, we actually know that in certain cases, languages can allow verbs to agree with nominals that aren't subjects. And Icelandic is literally a textbook example of such a language. Uh, so um, just to give you a, a flavor of this, um, a particular case in which you get this is um, uh, in, uh, sorry, I've been distracted because I've just realized that LaTeX has replaced my thorns with thetas. But uh, you get verbs where the subject of the verb is dative and some lower argument is nominative. And that's what you get with the verb like the verb to like in Icelandic has a dative subject and a nominative object. Um, and what you see in 58, I won't go into the arguments to show that indeed that dative really is a subject, but this is something which has been very well established over a long time. But what you see is you can actually get agreement in number with that um, with that object. And, um, and that's what you see in 58a, where you're getting third person plural agreement on like. A striking fact, though, in Icelandic is you get agreement for number. However, if that lower nominative argument is non third person, you cannot get agreement in person. And not only that, in most cases, it's just ungrammatical. So in 59A, and for now I'll just focus on the A examples, if you want to say she liked you, you can't have third singular agreement, but you also can't have second singular agreement. And in fact, there is just no good agreement in this case. So um, it's so this is a case of kind of ineffability. You have to find another way to say this completely. So this gets this is what might call a person effect. And I see that I'm taking a bit longer than I, I'd hoped at this point. So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, summarize the, the pattern here. And if anyone is uh, really interested in uh, Icelandic, I'd be happy to come back and, uh, and talk about this in more detail. Um, or to if you want to ask me questions, but I'll try to convey the gist of this. So essentially what we see here is that in Icelandic, you can agree in number. If you've got a dative nominative uh, sentence, you can agree in number with the, with the lower argument, the lower argument, the second argument. You can't agree with it in person. And in fact, if it's not third person, it's just ungrammatical. Now, um, and I, I think I got to skip over this. Um, and those of you who are, are, are agreement nerds, we can go back to it. Um, the, this is an account of how you derive that derive that um, effect. Um, but I don't want to keep you all very late. The the upshot, however, is uh, this is a way to derive that pattern and a crucial part of this account is people treat the dative argument as looking from the outside as though it was third person. And, and that's just a, a function uh, uh, is supposed to follow from the case that it has. The fact it's not nominative makes certain things inaccessible. So it gets treated as a third person noun, regardless of what person it actually has. But what that means is that 
if we're looking Icelandic, if we look at, if you look just at 63, so here's the case where you've got these dative nominative verbs. So you've got tense, and that's where we think agreement resides. The dative argument, which is which looks as far as agreement is concerned, looks like a third person element. And then you've got an, a lower nominative argument. For our, our copula clauses, if we're now entertaining the idea, they don't involve inversion. You've just got two DPs. Again, you've got tense. You've got two DPs. The first one is third person, because this is going to be an example like the problem is your parents or the problem is you. So that first noun phrase is third person. And then you've got another noun phrase, which could be third person. It could be plural or it could be first or second person. So if we assume there's no inversion in these copular clauses, these things look very parallel and we should find the same pattern of agreement. But the fact is we don't. Um, and uh, again, uh, so this is work that I'm engaged on currently with my colleague Jutta Hartmann from Bielefeld. Um, and so we've and we've been doing this mostly with online uh, question questionnaires or online experiments um, involving rating um, get people giving uh, judgments. And we set up one of these experiments. We're looking both at these dative nominative cases and at the copula cases so that we could get a minimal um, differences. We had the same people rating the um, both sets of cases. So we had the that made the data as comparable as we could. So the relevant case here then is a case in 64 where we've got the main problem, a form of the verb to be, negation, and then a second person plural. So the main problem wasn't you. And we gave them, uh, among the options they had were third person singular agreement on B, and second person plural agreement on B. So if you remember in the dative nominative cases, when you had a non third person as the lower argument, the thing that the verb is trying to agree with, the sentence was just ungrammatical. Um, and this was not what we found. So what we found was that the first case, that case in A, so this is where you get third person singular agreement. Most speakers rated this very highly. So this was found to be um, very, very acceptable by most of our speakers. And uh, on the other hand, the other possibility is full person agreement. So that's what you see in the B case. So this is where you're really agreeing with that second person plural. This was not right as good, but it was significantly and uh, to a not only significantly but by quite a large margin better than the equivalent in the dative nominative construction. So that strong person effect that you got in the um, in the dative nominative case, we did not replicate in these examples. So that is unexpected if these don't involve any kind of inversion. However, just very briefly, if we assume that, going back to the idea that there really is inversion, that is to say that when you've got something like the problem is you, you start out with you as in a higher position and the problem in a lower position, we've got a chance to derive the agreement facts correctly because what we can assume is that assuming agreement is downwards, that is to say that the agreement here is looking down the tree for something to agree with. Then if this noun phrase that's in the lowest position moves directly to a position above 
the agreeing head. What that agreeing head will see is this noun phrase, which is now the last one. So this is DP2 agreement. This is where you say the problem are you. On the other hand, if we assume that there's a position, say, at the left edge of the VP, where this noun phrase can move to. So if instead of moving directly to the top, it moves via this position, now it will be found, it'll be the first thing that that agreeing head sees. So that way you would get DP1 agreement, you get agreement with the first noun phrase. So at least we have a possible mechanism for how you could get agreement with one or the other. What we do have to assume is that in this case, no, actually, forget that. So that's, um, we have a handle on how to do this. Um, what we do have to do though is, I've said here, I've got this mysterious F, right? So before what we had as a complement to B was a small clause, and we had, um, Bowers was suggesting there was a pred head for the small clause or a PR head. And here I'm just calling it F for functional head. Well, what is that head? What we can say is we can make it, what we need it to be is a version of what Romero said B can mean. That is, we need to say that the meaning she ascribed to B, we are now going to ascribe to this functional head. That is, it's something which combines with uh, an individual concept and an individual, but it takes them in the opposite order from what Romero was assuming, because we think that actually the, the, um, the uh, individual concept has to be the lower of the two rather than the higher. This does leave us with uh, an unresolved question, however, and that is, we've seen that, or I've tried to argue that the predicate, a real predicate in a predicate of a small clause cannot move past a subject and become the subject of the higher, uh, of the higher clause. If it could, we'd get these undesirable results we didn't get. I've argued instead that what you see in these specificational cases is uh, uh, is just this special case. It's uh, an individual concept, and it's generated as the complement to this F head. What is mysterious, and this is really worrying to me as a syntactician, is how can we prevent predicates from doing that movement and not prevent the complement of this F head, so prevent these specificational subjects? So, so I've taken up a lot of your time, um, so let me conclude. Um, I've tried to give you some sense, uh, I hope, of some of the really uh, surprising um, and, uh, for a syntactician at least, interesting questions that arise as soon as you start poking a little bit at the question of nominal predication, how it is that noun phrases can actually function as predicates. And I've tried to suggest it can help us to give us some additional insights into the syntax of definites, definiteness in general, definite noun phrases. Um, I've had to skip over some of the more intricate details of agreement, but I think it, um, it's one more um, uh, brick in what's turning out to be a really interesting building that's going on currently, looking at some of the complexities in agreement cross-linguistically. And the last thing I would say is that all of this um, would benefit tremendously from more empirical work on more and unrelated languages. So if any of you uh, have got any new ideas in this or already have ideas that you want to tell me about um, on languages that you work in, I would really love to hear them. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, I know listening to Zoom talks is not quite the same as being in the room. So thank you very much for still being there. And I'll stop at this point. Thank you.